Monsters is a show about the worst human beings on the planet. Viewer discretion is advised. If you'd like to support the show, the easiest way is to donate a few bucks at buymeacoffee.com forward slash monsters. There's more information about supporting us in the video's info or at our website, thisismonsters.com forward slash support. Sabrina Lamone began having an affair with Jonathan Hearn at the end of 2012. She felt a strong connection with him despite already being married to Robert Lamone. Since Robert was opposed to getting a divorce, the couple would have to come up with another plan to make their dreams of getting married a reality. This is Monsters. In the United States, about 50% of Americans over the age of 18 are married. Almost 50% of those marriages will end in divorce. Getting a divorce is easier now than it used to be. Decades ago, it was common to have to prove wrongdoing on the part of one spouse, which wasn't always possible. There are also multiple types of divorce now, such as uncontested divorce, no-fault divorce, and limited divorce. These different types of divorce make it easier for people to be able to find a way to get out of their marriage that works better for them. Some people still resist the idea of divorce for many different reasons. Many religions and cultures believe that marriage is a permanent union and that you cannot get a divorce, no matter the situation. The threat of being ostracized by their church or family members keeps them in a marriage even if the relationship is unhealthy. Sabrina Lamone met Robert Lamone in Prescott, Arizona when she was only 18 years old and he was 21. The couple quickly moved in together and they were married a few years later. In 2000, Robert got a job with the BNSF Railroad at the Barstow Rail Yard, so the Lamones moved to a house in Hellendale, California. The couple had two children, a son, Robbie, and a daughter, Leanna. The family lived a comfortable, quiet life in the small community. Hellendale was the name of the town, and within that is a private community called Silver Lakes. It's located on historic Route 66, tucked between Barstow and Victorville. It's mainly a resort town that consists of two man-made lakes, the North Lake and the South Lake. These lakes consist of a series of peninsulas that create 16 strips of land with waterfront houses on each side. Lamone testified that her marriage changed in 2008. And how did your relationship with Rob change? We opened our marriage bed and it changed the dynamics of um, our sacred bond. Who was it that you initially uh, became involved with in that sense? At the time, just another couple, one other couple. Uh, who was that? Dale and Nicole Smith. How did this opening up your marriage and entering into an open marriage affect your relationship with Rob? I don't even know how to explain it. I mean, it just, like I said, our sacred, our sacred bond that we had was broken as soon as we made that choice together. And it, I don't even know how to explain it. Lamone describes that her and Robert decided to open their marriage to other partners. She said they were initially involved with one other couple, Dale and Nicole Smith. At some point during the time uh, after you opened up your relationship and, and began uh, you and Rob and becoming involved with Dale Smith and his uh, wife, Nicole, um, did you and Dale become somewhat involved in a, an emotional relationship? Uh, yes, we did. They, they uh, had problems prior to meeting Robert and I, so they, they already had a, a rocky relationship. And... Uh, 
it just got worse for them, and I became uh, who who Dell found to um, um, confide in, depend on, um, that listened to him, and and um, it was an emotional relationship. Yes. Was it necessarily still a sexual relationship, or was it more of an emotional type? It was of an coffee? emotional relationship. Lamone began having an emotional relationship with Dale as his marriage to Nicole was not in a good place. Robert told his wife to stop seeing Dale, and she did. After that, they became involved in a larger group of couples who would go on adult-only group vacations where it was speculated that they were involved in a swinger's lifestyle, but the other couples in the group deny that. Only one other couple, Jason and Kelly Bernatine, admitted to engaging in sexual activity with the Lamones, and they said that it didn't include intercourse. So there were no instances where you or your wife or Sabrina and Robert were all in bed together? So that did happen. Sleeping together. So my wife and I and Rob and Sabrina um, would engage in sexual activities, but it was not wife swapping. It was more girls, and Rob never had sex with Kelly, and I never had sex with Sabrina. As far as you know. As far as I know. Lamone suspected that Robert and Kelly were having a private relationship of their own, but Kelly denied that during her testimony. Lamone said that her husband became obsessed with pornography and would spend much of his time on internet porn sites. She admitted in court that she also became obsessed with sex. After their children began full-time school, Lamone started working at a Costco in Victorville. She actually worked for an independent contractor who hired the people who set up at the end of the aisles and handed out samples. It was while working at Costco that she met Jonathan Hearn. Hearn was working for the San Bernardino Fire Department as a paramedic, and one of his duties was to do the grocery shopping for the firehouse. When did you first meet Sabrina Lamont? Um, August of 2012. What led you to meet Miss Lamone in August of 2012. Um, well, uh, I had recently been assigned at my fire station. I was working in a new department and had been assigned some duties to uh, purchase commissary, uh, restock food in the fire station. So, um, having recently incurred that that duty, I was. Uh, became a member at Costco and started going to Costco and uh, ran into her a number of times. Um, initially, when we met, uh, I was just shopping for the department uh, at Costco. Okay. Now, when you first uh, met Miss Lamone, you said that you spoke with her subsequently on your visits? I did. Okay. How did that, uh, not necessarily relationship, but friendship progress? Uh, the first time I remember meeting her, um, we struck up a conversation. She asked what I was shopping for. I think I explained some of that, and she explained that she had a friend who was a firefighter as well uh, named Jason Bernatine. At that time, I let her know that I, I knew Jason, and um, so we had that in common. And um, uh, she seemed very friendly, very, very nice. Um, he had run into Lamone multiple times while shopping at Costco for the firehouse. Hearn explains that he didn't know that she was married at first. It was the second or third time that I ran into her. Uh, I, I remember um, she had remembered my name and uh, spoke to me directly saying, hi, Jonathan, and I couldn't remember her name. And uh, feeling bad about that, uh, but then also kind of uh, noticing the fact that she had remembered my name, which was neat. And um, so I think it was on the third time that I was in Costco that I got her number. Um, at, at that time and prior to that, uh, I had noticed she had no wedding ring on. So, um, 
and hadn't mentioned anything about being married. So uh, I had asked for a number and um, she gave it and we talked um, and texted. I want to say it was within a week or two after I got her number. Uh, she called me one time and set the record straight and said, you know I'm married, right? Because I had been uh, flirting, you know, we'd been flirting back and forth. And um, I explained that I didn't realize she was married. I didn't see that she had a ring on and she said that at work she doesn't wear rings. Um, I guess it's not allowed at her place of employment. So um, jewelry that is. And um, so uh, at that point I said, you know, I recognized that she was married and um, we agreed to just talk as friends and uh, however the, the flirting did continue um, over text and phone calls. Hearn hadn't seen a ring on Lamone, so he assumed that she was single. She did make sure that he knew that she was married and just wasn't allowed to wear jewelry at work. Once he knew that she was married, they agreed to remain friends, but it clearly didn't stay that way. Jonathan Hearn was a fairly sheltered 22-year-old man. He grew up in a very religious family and went to a private school. He was well-educated and knew early on that he wanted to be a paramedic. He had done all of the schooling and passed all the tests to become a paramedic at the earliest age possible. He hadn't really had a relationship, though. At that point, uh, had, had you had a steady girlfriend? No. Had you been in a relationship? Um, not very, not very steady ones. No. And when you use the word steady, what do you mean? Um, I would say typically, uh, I would see a girl or she would see me and, uh, say in passing, we would, whether at work or, uh, school or just, uh, at the store, whatever. Um, if I was attracted to that person, get their number, talk to them, uh, text, uh, go on dates, see uh, if we enjoyed each other's company. And um, for the most part, um, none of those relationships materialized into anything. So when I met her, around that time, um, I think it was a little bit different because maybe um, on paper it didn't necessarily look like exactly the match that I'd be going for, um, but uh, like I said, she was somebody that stood out to me automatically as having a role, magnetic personality, and um, was a, she's a, a very I don't know how to describe it exactly, but a very loving and attentive and uh, caring kind of person. He said that he had gone on dates, but none of the relationships turned into anything serious. Hearn claims that after they made out one night, he had second thoughts about the relationship. I said, I'm, I'm trying to look into the future of this, and I don't think it's probably, I don't see it leading to anything, uh, anything good. Um... So let's kind of back off. And she, she agreed and said, well, could we still kind of talk as friends? Well, the, that from November to then December, um, not only did we keep talking, but m more than as friends started flirting and uh, put ourselves in kind of a position spending time together where it turned into a full-fledged affair. So by the end of December 2012, uh, we were carrying on a full-on affair. When you used the word affair, you were having sex with Miss Lamont. Yeah. Even though he claims to have suggested that they remain just friends, the two began having an affair which lasted about two years. Three or four months into the affair, Hearn called a mutual friend, Jason Bernatine, and asked for Robert's phone number. Bernatine didn't give him his phone number, but he told Robert to call Hearn. Did you become aware or did you receive a call from Robert Lamont about you having an affair with his wife? I did. When did that occur? March or April of 2013. Now, after you received that call from Robert, what did you do? A 
Um, sometime over the next week, approximately, I remember getting uh, contacting Jason Bernatine, uh, our mutual friend, and asking for Rob's number. Uh, at which time, um, Jason confronted me and asked if I was messing with Sabrina, and uh, I lied and said that I, I really wasn't, uh, or nothing serious, uh, but that I would like to get Rob's number. Um, and instead, he had Rob call me, and uh, I talked to him for a little bit, and uh, without confessing to a full-on affair, I did acknowledge that um, as he had seen some of our gushing conversations in, in her phone, uh, that we definitely had a, a pretty serious emotional affair going on, and I apologized uh, for that. And um, uh, so, yeah, I talked to him for probably 10, 15 minutes. Lamone testified that she and Robert were at Jason Bernatine's house helping him with some renovations when Hearn called. Robert called him back on Lamone's phone, and once he was done with the call, he broke her phone. She testified that they argued, and she agreed to not see Hearn any longer, but she didn't hold to that promise. As the couple's relationship went on, the subject of Robert came up more often. Lamone describes why she started the affair during her testimony. An emotional or, or an extramarital affair. How did, why did you do that? Why did you become involved with him? There's no right answer to say to that. I don't know. Um, the attention that he um, pursued on me, um, the, the attention he showed me, was um, very different than anything I'd ever, um, or that I, I guess I should say what I was getting at that moment in my, that time in my life. I don't know why I pursued a relationship with him. Was there something about your relationship with Jonathan that you felt you needed? Apparently there was, and at that time it became our sacred relationship and um, and I guess that's now looking at it what I was lacking in my life, in my marriage. She says that something was missing in her marriage, and Hearn confirms that she was not happy with her husband. He was pretty exploitative, or at least she expressed to me that he was pretty exploitative and um, objectifying her, and pretty much uh, the, the emotional entanglement or conflict with that was that um, here she was, married to him, but yet he was willing to pretty much pass her off to any other guy and not really leave the, the doors of their marriage closed so much to the outside world. And so that impropriety was a pretty, um, I would say the most significant one, but we did delve into just uh, many, many other quirks that she mentioned as far as um, just that he wasn't very concerned with their marriage, that his, his solutions to, or his responses to, uh, say, for instance, when he discovered that we were having an affair, was not at all to address the health of his marriage, but rather to just kind of avoid those things and um, go shopping and focus on other things, um, which dovetails into a kind of another complaint was that he was very focused on his own interests and not so much the interests of his family or his kids. Um, she expressed that he, he rarely included the kids in um, his projects, but was pretty focused on his uh, partying, his truck, his boat, his, uh, his interests, I'll just say. Uh, he explains that Robert was not interested in their marriage or even involving his family in his interests. By Valentine's Day of 2014, the couple were wanting to get married. At this time, February 14th, 2014, what future were you speaking about with Miss Lamone? A uh, marriage. 
February 14th, 2014, did that future include the death of Robert Lamone? Yes. Did you settle on a method to kill Robert initially? Yes, I did. What was the initial method that you decided upon? Uh, poisoning. Did you have any other methods in mind? Briefly considered some others, yes, but... And when you came up with these methods, was this by yourself or in conjunction with Ms. Lamont? in conjunction with Sabrina. Lamone denies any knowledge of the plan to murder her husband. At any time when you were communicating on these Gmail messages between you and Jonathan, did you and he ever have communications about him poisoning Robert? Absolutely not. No. Did you know anything about Jonathan researching things about arsenic poisoning? No. Did you know that he was planning on trying to put arsenic poison in anything for your husband? No. Did he ever, in April, March, April, May, June, July, into August of 2014, did he ever provide you with any vanilla wafer banana pudding to give to Robert. No. In court, one piece of evidence against Lamone is a Valentine's Day card that she gave to Hearn where she wrote that they were made for each other and about her future with him. On the stand, she claimed that it was only a fantasy and that she wasn't referring to the murder of her husband so that they could get married. She maintained during her trial that Hearn began controlling her, not physically but emotionally, which can happen. I don't ever want to say that someone isn't in a controlling relationship just because it isn't visibly obvious. The prosecution spent a decent amount of time pointing out the naked photos she had sent him, the pictures of them together, and the messages she wrote him professing her love and talking about their future together. She even admitted that she had pursued Hearn just as much as he had pursued her. The prosecutor displayed text message after text message of Lamone professing her love for Hearn in the days after Robert's death. Within a few weeks, she was carrying on text messages about her daily life as if Robert never existed. People believe that Lamone testifying in her own defense hurt her chances at an acquittal. Her constant answers of, I don't know, I don't remember, and I don't know what I meant by that, solidified her image of a cheating wife who conspired to have her husband killed. By the middle of 2014, Hearn and Lamone were planning the murder of Robert Lamone. Hearn explains why they came to the decision to use poison. And why did you settle on poisoning, you and Sabrina? Just because of the, the thought that uh, poisoning could present as a medical issue and not a criminal issue, which would reduce the likelihood of uh, criminal investigation being uh, waged. And so um, just because of the likelihood or the the uh, hope of escaping being caught, uh, I thought that might be a better option. What information did Sabrina provide to you to assist you in planning the poisoning of Robert Lamont? Uh, a lot of things, uh, including but not limited to um she did she did express that uh well to back up she told me that he had had a, a little bit of uh um i'm sorry he had had a uh, kind of a rare medical condition the the name of it escapes me right now but he had had a, a rare medical condition that had presented with some symptoms that might uh be mimicked uh, in a in a poisoning attempt, and so um, she told me about his medical history pretty extensively, and how um, he had gone to a specialty hospital for this in our area, and um, uh, she also mentioned that even recently he'd been having some stomach issues, and uh, since we knew that poisoning would present with those flu-like almost symptoms, nausea, vomiting, bowel irregularities, stuff like that. Um, 
she mentioned that he had been having some of those symptoms recently, uh, and that was a good thing as far as masking the, the expected symptoms. According to Hearn, Lamone told him that Robert had a medical condition that would look like a poisoning if he died from it. Along with that, he had been having stomach issues that would mask the side effects of the poison. I couldn't find anywhere in the testimony of Lamone where she explains how Hearn would have gotten that information if it wasn't from her. Uh, she provides you, you said, food to eat or suggested food items. Uh, which food items did she suggest that uh, Robert Lamone was sure to eat? Uh, she gave me two suggestions. One of some sort of sandwich or wrap that could be gotten, uh, could be purchased at Costco. Um, and then also uh, banana pudding with Nilla wafers. Lamone also gave him suggestions of what type of food to put the poison in. One of Robert's favorite snacks was banana pudding with Nilla wafers in it. There was also no explanation of how Hearn would have known this or how he was supposed to deliver it to Robert. According to Hearn, he gave the tainted pudding to Lamone, who was supposed to include the pudding in Robert's lunch the next day. Hearn used a prepaid credit card to load a PayPal account with funds to use to purchase arsenic trioxide. The first couple of suppliers he found required a background check in order to sell the poison, but due to the wonders of the internet, he was able to find a supplier that was willing to sell it with no checks. He had the poison delivered to his grandparents' art studio. After receiving the poison, Hearn looked up some details about how much poison to use per the weight of the victim. You have, re just to set the, the scene, you've received the arsenic trioxide, um, you have it at your home, what do you do next? Um, I don't remember the timeline on when I progressed with, uh, with the arsenic I had, I had purchased, but uh, eventually, it, just because I, I still worked and had a busy life that I was carrying on. Uh, so I do remember on, on one of the days when I had some free time and was off, um, I, I uh, examined the product, uh, also <coughs> tested um, the, the dosing um, the, 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 well, I don't, I don't want to say suggested dosing because no one suggests it, but, uh, the, what I believe to be the toxic loading dose of arsenic, uh, and it's a, a dose by weight ratio. And so I experimented with that, uh, on a neighbor dog who had caused me considerable, uh, issues in the past and put it on some, some meat and uh, put the arsenic, that is, on some meat and gave it to the dog to see what would happen. Um, after that time, and I want to say it was within uh, a few days after that, was when I actually prepared then a batch for uh, Robert knowing that he was going to be going up to work into Hatchby because Sabrina had let me know his uh, shift schedule. Well, the information of weight ratio to amount of arsenic, where did you learn that information? Wait, that's your next question? He just explained that he had poisoned a dog as a test run and the prosecutor pretends like that never happened. Oh, you poisoned a dog to check your weight ratios? Good thinking. Where'd you learn about the weight ratios? After the test run was unfortunately successful, Hearn mixed up a batch of poisoned banana pudding and delivered it to Lamone at her home. The following morning, Lamone put the pudding into her husband's lunch, and he went to work. The cheating couple quickly started having cold feet. Hearn tells the prosecutor that they were concerned that their cell phones would be connected if the poisoning became investigated as foul play. After having thought about it uh, a little bit, uh, the next day when he was to have been poisoned, the day he was to have been poisoned, um, I remember uh, speaking to her on the phone and uh, expressing that 
I too was also starting to be concerned about the idea of um, being tracked through cell phones. And so I thought it was best uh, we agreed to uh, call him if possible and divert him from eating that, that poison laced uh, pudding. And then that after that we would go ahead and get uh, some sort of extra phone line for her that, that wouldn't be related to her personal phone. At this point, the couple decided to abort the plan and get Lamona burner phone so that they could communicate with each other without creating an obvious connection to each other in the event of a murder investigation. The conversations that you have with her after you find out the poison is in his lunch, what do they involve? A level of concern, um, a desire not to be found out. What are the conversations about? Uh, I believe it was one one phone call that we had where, um, just to clarify, she had mentioned uh, the cell phone concern when I dropped off the poison the previous day. But at that time, it wasn't too much of a concern to me. Um, but in retrospect, I, I thought about it. And uh, the next day, when it was to have been sent, uh, I called her and we spoke about obviously not wanting to be caught and uh, just in the, I told her I thought it was unlikely that it would be investigated, excuse me, investigated as a criminal uh, investigation, but just if it was, uh, that it wasn't worth that risk. So to hold off and um, she let me know that uh, after that, that she had called Robert, excuse me, to clarify, uh, we had that first conversation, then she called Robert and then she let me know after that that she had told him to to not eat the po not eat the pudding because uh, I think she said that she told him the bananas had gone bad in it. Lamone called Robert and told him the bananas had gone bad and to not eat the pudding. This led to Hearn and Lamone spending time communicating via burner phone to separate themselves for three or four months prior to their next plan. Hearn became concerned about trying to kill Robert with poison again. What steps did you take towards the second attempt? Um, I did a little reconsidering of the initial plot to poison him and uh, thought that the poisoning would probably not be actually the best uh, plot to carry out a second time uh, just based on uh, if I was made a suspect, I figured, uh, you know, it, um, with my medical background and training, um, poisoning might actually make me more of a suspect than something that was more out of character uh, for me, uh, like uh, violence. Um, so uh, I guess as far as what I did, I reconsidered and, and thought that it might be better to just uh, approach him directly uh, for the killing. He didn't want to become a suspect due to his medical knowledge, so the new plan was to just approach Robert and shoot him. The couple began preparing for Hearn to surprise Robert at work and shoot him there. Hearn describes the help he got from Lamone during the planning. Now, when you're uh, planning or lead up to the second attempt, what information did Sabrina provide you? Um, well, she described uh, the facility for me because I didn't have knowledge of um, the layout or whatnot. So she she expressed that it was a, a industrial building at the end of a long road um, and its proximity to some uh, houses nearby, um, or no correction, she didn't tell me that part. She just said it was an industrial facility at the end of a long road. And then she offered to find me uh, pictures of the facility that she thought she had from, from before. Um, later on, shortly before, she, she described the office layout and the interior uh, she verbally described the interior uh, to give me a kind of an idea of what to expect inside. Um, she gave me some other sort of uh, 
heads up or or advice on on avoiding detection as far as she told me that the the responder vehicles at the at the location had recently installed forward facing uh, cameras on the on the utility trucks um, and just obviously to avoid the front of the truck um, just I guess little incidental concerns like uh, she had expressed that it would be better that I take my motorcycle instead of my truck because uh, I drove a pretty loud diesel truck at that time um, and my motorcycle was quieter uh, at that time it was my intention and expressed to her that my thought was to go out at night time and because he worked occasionally a night shifts out there so um, the idea of a quieter vehicle uh, just so as to not uh, wake people up or, or you know have witnesses potentially um, so we discussed the location some of those those uh, other incidental concerns but um, I'm trying to think I know as I needed uh, specific logistical information she was able to provide some of those things while on his way back from an out-of-town trip Hearn was passing by the area where the assassination was going to take place and scouted the location. Then he made the last few preparations. You said that you uh, did final preparations on a silencer. What were those preparations? Um, I believe just attaching it to a, a threaded barrel that I had for my Glock and um, uh, making final assembly. It was a uh, it required me to put on end caps onto it and then assemble it onto the firearm. Okay. Where did you get the threaded barrel? Um, online. Why did you purchase the threaded barrel? Uh, to be used with a silencer for a rob situation. And describe how you made the silencer. Um, it's essentially using a uh, large mag light um, where uh, the end caps are are replaced with um, drilled end caps to mit to fit the caliber of bullet that'll be passing through it, and then uh, five four or five uh, freeze plugs from an engine that also fit in the inside diameter of the mag light are then placed at uh, increasingly or rather decreasing distances so as to capture the sound um, as the bullet passes through so uh, by uh, essentially assembling all that and uh, gluing everything into place and uh, assembling it for for use Hearn made his own silencer, which he said he tested and it worked very well. He also put together the clothes he was going to wear, a mask, extra ammunition, and he used some adhesive flashing to change the color of his motorcycle's gas tank and rear fender. On August 17, 2014, Jonathan Hearn drove to the rail yard that Robert Lamone was working at in Tehachapi and shot him to death. One of Robert's co-workers arrived at the building to start a shift and found him leaning against one of the trucks in a pool of blood. He called 911 and attempted CPR, but when he told the operator that his compressions were pushing blood out of Robert's mouth, they instructed him to exit the building and wait for police. Senior Deputy Sheriff Robert Meyer was dispatched to the scene where detectives were already on site, investigating the crime. Robert Lamone was inside one of the buildings of the facility, lying dead on the floor. The medical examiner describes the injuries on Robert. What were your findings? The direction for gunshot wound number one is uh, primarily from front to back, from the front of his body to the back of his body, and then exited the body. The bullet perforated the left mandible, fracturing it, went through his mouth, 
um, graze the left side of the uh, cervical spinal column in the neck, and then um, perforated the muscle in the back of the neck and exited the body. There was injury to the spinal cord. Moving on to gunshot wound two, were you able to locate an entrance? Yes, I was. Okay. And where did you discern the entrance uh, wound was for gunshot number two? Gunshot number two, again, the two does not uh, necessarily um, indicate the order of firing. Um, the two is just for my reference. Um, but for number two, the entrance wound is on the upper right front of the chest. The investigators found a surveillance video that showed the vehicles that were passing by the facility the night of the murder. They were able to track down all but one of the vehicles that passed by in the video and eliminate them as suspects. The last vehicle remaining was a man on a motorcycle. Like any good homicide detective, Sheriff Meyer interviewed Sabrina Lamone about her husband's murder. She gave him details about his work schedule and assured him that there was nobody that she could think of that would want to hurt her husband. Friends noticed Hearn's vehicles parked outside of the Lamones' home just days after the murder and conveyed their concern to authorities. Eventually, Hearn was identified as a suspect, and Sheriff Meyer looked into his phone records. Now, in the course of your investigation, did you learn Jonathan Hearn's cellular phone number? I did. Now, based on that information, uh, what requests did you make, or what search warrants did you enter? At that point in time, I had felt that he was possibly involved uh, in the murder of Robert Lamone, so I authored a search warrant for his phone records and sent him off to the telephone company uh, to receive those records. Did you review those records at some time? Yes, I did. Did you see a uh, subsequent number of that was a common number called by Jonathan Hearn? Yes, I did. And that number showed up about on uh, April 25th of 2014. And between that time of April 25th to September 1st, there were over 7,000 communications uh, with that telephone number, either by text message or voice call. Based on that, what follow-up investigation did you do for that cellular phone number? At that point in time, I sent, or actually got another uh, search warrant authored by a judge and sent that information off to the cellular telephone provider. They returned information on that cell phone, however, not having a, uh, a subject's name attached to that phone number. At that point in time, I figured it was a phone, either a pay-as-you-go pay phone or what's commonly referred to as a burner phone. you later find out uh, who was in possession of the phone with the number 760-998-7958? Yes, sir. Who uh, was in possession of that phone? I later learned that that phone uh, was possessed by uh, Sabrina Lamone. Once the pair became suspects in the murder of Robert Lamone, they were placed under surveillance and their phones were tapped. During one of their post-murder conversations, Hearn asked Lamone to read Psalm 38 and Psalm 51. These passages refer to the story of King David's lust for Bathsheba, the wife of one of his most devout soldiers, Uriah. David and Bathsheba later had an affair resulting in pregnancy while Uriah was away. David then arranged for Uriah to be killed so that he and Bathsheba could be married. In a November 2014 recorded phone call, Hearn told Lamone, quote, David is a lot like you and I. He made a lot of mistakes and was someone who committed adultery and went on to kill the guy. He went out of his way to cover up his sin, end quote. In November of 2014, both Jonathan Hearn and Sabrina Lamone were arrested for the murder of Robert Lamone. Lamone was released without charges shortly afterward, but Hearn took a plea deal to testify against Lamone in exchange for 25 years in prison without the possibility of parole. Lamone was re-arrested in January. The month-long trial had a parade of law enforcement, friends, and family members take the stand. The prosecutor showed all of the photos, text messages, and call logs that pointed to Lamone being a willing participant in the murder of her husband. 
Hearn took the stand and detailed how the murder plot came together and how Lamone gave him all of the details about Robert so that he could kill him and get away with it. The defense stood strong that Lamone had no idea that Hearn was planning to kill Robert. In a last-ditch effort to talk her way out of a murder conviction, Lamone took the stand and testified in her own defense. That was a move that would ultimately cost Lamone her freedom, because her defense lawyer said he felt like it hurt her. It's not surprising since the prosecutor took the opportunity to show just how guilty she looked. He started by reading some of the note that Lamone wrote to Hearn on Valentine's Day. Top my Jonathan. I love you for finding the part of me that I never thought I'd find. I love you for wanting and needing me by your side. I love for you being the one you choose to care for. I love you for the special meaning you have brought to my life. I love you for hopes and faith in our future together. Go over that line again. I love you for the hopes and faith in our future together. Future together. And this was written six months before your husband was killed by the man you wrote that note to. He continues to focus on her statements of having a future with Hearn. I love you for so many reasons. I've only written a few. But in all that years bring to us. This is something that is your Planning a future together, what the years bring to us. It's not what the years bring to Robert and you, what the years bring to us. What did you mean by that statement? I don't know what I meant by that statement. Besides the life I was living with Jonathan, I'm sure the things I wrote to Robert were something... I never want you to forget that you were made for me and I was made for you. So you were made for Jonathan. Jonathan and I would talk a lot about our, the, uh, our paths crossing for a reason, purpose. We were meant to know one another kind of a thing. So I guess that's how part of me felt. Since you were made for each other, you were meant to be together. I don't know. I was not in a... Well, we My priorities we were wrote, off at that time. We just saw we wrote a future together, and now you're talking about being meant for each other. Since you were made for each other, you were meant to be together. No. Uh, you realize these are your own words. I do realize that. Okay. The prosecutor also brings up the fact that she never brought up Hearn when detectives asked her if Robert had any problems with anyone. She had previously explained that she didn't bring up any of the details of their open relationship because she didn't want to sully his legacy. Now you've talked a lot about that you wouldn't want to sully uh, Robert's uh, legacy. That's kind of what you're using as your reason. Is that fair? Yes. So the first one starts out, now, as far as Robert goes, do you know of him having any trouble with anybody? That's not talking about a relationship whatsoever. That's talking about, does Robert have any animosity with anybody? And you answered, never. Okay. What effect does that have on Robert's legacy? Robert didn't have, um, he didn't have trouble with um, getting along with others. Okay. Well, I think there was a guy that he told over and over again to stay away from his wife. Do you recall that? Yes, he had uh, spoken to uh, Jonathan on one occasion and again uh, through a text message. Do you know of him having any trouble with anyone? You answered in the negative. And then you followed up with, everybody loved Robert. Was that true? That's how my heart still feels till this day. Okay. Jonathan loved Robert. I wasn't thinking about Jonathan at that time at all. 
And then the question was asked, does any issues with your relationship? After you've been asked if Robert has any problems with anyone. Right. Okay. To that, you said no. Yes. So, so far, we've got three lies to law enforcement within the first few hours. Lamone tried to explain that she didn't bring up Hearn when asked if Robert had any problems with anyone because she just didn't think of it. The reality was that she didn't mention Hearn because he was the obvious answer and she was protecting him. This was the same reason she continued communicating with Hearn via burner phone even after her husband's death. The same reason she got concerned when she heard that one of her friends had seen Hearn's truck outside of her house. She didn't want people to connect their affair with the murder of her husband. It also didn't help that the person in charge of insurance payouts for the BNSF rail yard testified that she came asking about a death settlement while her husband's death was still being investigated. Many people have added the financial windfall that Lamone would receive if her husband died at work as the motivation for his murder being planned to happen while he was on the clock. Despite hiring a new attorney for the sentencing phase of her trial and a motion for a new trial, on February 21, 2018, the judge denied the motion and Sabrina Lamone was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. On December 3, 2020, Lamone's attorney filed a motion to have her conviction overturned due to Hearn's testimony not being corroborated by other evidence. It could take more than a year for the Court of Appeals to make its ruling. If you're interested in reading more about this story, you can read the book Better Off Dead by Michael Fleeman. Thanks so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, give us a thumbs up, leave us a comment, and make sure to hit the subscribe button to ensure you don't miss a video. Also, remember that if you'd like to support the show, you can find information on how to do that in the video's info or at thisismonsters.com forward slash support. Thanks again.